Hi. This presentation is the last of three providing background and context for the study of computer hardware. Clip 2 looked at the advances in electronics contributing to computer development and particularly the provision of a year-on-year -year supply of extra transistors to build computers in accordance with Moore's law. This part looks at the issues and the strategies that can be deployed in the design of computer hardware using these transistors to deliver ongoing advances in performance. Checking once more with Moore's Law shows that from the early 1990s the rate of performance improvement has been around 50% per annum. The contribution of semiconductor technology gets approximately 35% of this and hence the contribution of developments in computer architecture is around 15% a year. Over the past few years, however, this pace of advance has slowed to 20% overall, owing to factors including limits on CPU clock rates arising from power dissipation problems. Which is a pity, as an easy way to improve processor performance is simply to make everything run faster by speeding up the clock. Using the extra transistors to improve performance by changes to computer architecture has turned out to be increasingly more difficult. Let's look back at the operation of the basic von Neumann machine to see where some of the performance issues arise. It operates on a series of simple machine code instructions, each of which has to be fetched in from memory across the bus, decoded, and then any operands have to be fetched across the bus too and passed to the ALU where the instruction is executed, and results have then to be stored back into memory across the bus. Identifying the bottlenecks in this process shows the first issue as the one-at-a-time sequence of operations. Problems in the real world tend to happen at the same time, and it's often both possible and desirable to work on several bits of their solutions at once. Also, the machine can only execute simple binary-coded machine instructions rather than real-world natural language, creating difficulties of error-free translation and communication with the machine. It requires special skills to communicate well with both computers and human beings. Then there is the necessity to send all instructions and data to and fro across a single bus, as this will introduce contention problems and speed limits. Finally, there's the fact that memory remains much slower than the CPU, and program execution will therefore be held up by each instruction and operand transferred. It's also apparent from a look at the vertical structure of the machine on this slide that it's a complex system of interacting hardware and software components centered on the instruction set architecture or ISA. Dealing with any complex system can be tricky and structural changes can bring unexpected and sometimes undesirable consequences. For example, the ISA instructions should ideally be readily understandable and usable by human programmers for fast, error-free application development. But high-level or natural language instructions are difficult to build in hardware and overall performance may well be reduced. Another problem is that while it is necessary to develop computer architectures to make use of new fabrication technologies and to address new applications, it's also necessary to protect the huge investments in existing architectures and applications. It wouldn't be economically sensible to develop new software from scratch for every generation of machines, let alone to persuade users to forego all of their previous investments in the old stuff. The principal issue is how to best deploy the ongoing increases in transistor count to improve computer performance for real applications. Following Professor Katz of Stanford University, these are the principal strategies that are being deployed to achieve this. As embodied in processors such as those shown here from the early Intel 8080 to the latest core designs. The first issue is how best to handle a complex system. The general systems approach is to represent it using appropriate model descriptions that can then be used with optimization strategies to try to improve performance and simulation tools to evaluate results. It's important to represent the system at the correct level of abstraction 
in order to have sufficient information to cope with the problem at hand, but not enough to become overwhelmed with detail. This slide shows some of the descriptions for interacting with the computer structure shown previously at different levels of abstraction. At the top level, the problem is to translate a strategy for solving a real-world problem into a consistent step-by-step -step algorithm. A graphical language such as Stateflow or UML can help visualize the algorithm operation for effective communications and debugging. The advantage of such tools is in the simulation and verification of behavior along with the possibly automatic translation of the algorithm into high-level language source code. Dealing with a machine at high-level language level is the domain of the computer programmer. HLLs are compiled directly to binary machine code instructions from the instruction set architecture, but their mnemonic form in assembly level language provides a more detailed view of the actual machine operation than HLLs and hence an insight into issues such as the allocation of machine resources that are normally hidden in an HLL. Nowadays though, with sophisticated and efficient compilers, programming at the assembler level of detail is usually restricted to critical performance issues. On the hardware side, the large-scale organization of the machine can be described graphically by block diagrams or tools like SysML, or in a transaction-level hardware description computer language such as System C. The logic gates and registers can be described graphically by schematic diagrams on an ECAD simulator, such as those from Synopsys or Mentographics, or alternatively by register transfer-level hardware description language such as Verilog or VHDL, or mathematically by state machines, Boolean algebra, or difference equations. Further down, there are the analog circuits that the logic is built from, described by analog circuit diagrams or differential equations. And it may be a step too far are the polygons of silicon layout and the design rules for the particular fabrication technology. There are then many different descriptions of the same machine at different levels of abstraction and detail and appropriate for different uses. Ideally, one description would provide a seamless zoom from an easy-to-understand overview to any required level of detail, but in practice, many different descriptions and tools may be used. The issue for software design is the translation of an algorithm into an optimal sequence of ISA instructions, a process that is becoming increasingly automated and supported by design tools. The issue for hardware design is the optimal execution of the types of ISA instruction sequences found in the range of applications forming the target market of the processor. The big advantage of executable descriptions like Stateflow or System C is the ability to test the value of innovations against performance without having to actually build the machine before the design has been verified. This slide illustrates a couple of points about processor performance. The first is that designing a general purpose processor to be a jack of all trades, optimized to run as wide a range of applications as possible, will inevitably lead to compromises over building hardware to support tasks such as matrix manipulation, say, that are only infrequently found on average, though they may be common in one particular application. An issue then is what performance measures are the most appropriate to most users, this comes down to the time it takes to complete running their particular application programs, rather than more abstract measures such as MIPS. This leads to an appropriate emphasis on time to complete representative benchmark suites of applications, rather than the latency or time to complete individual instructions. One of the biggest bottlenecks of the von Neumann machine is in its sequential operation. The standard real-world approach to speeding up big tasks is to split them up and use more resources operating in parts of the work concurrently. There is usually, however, some overhead with this. Armdahl's law shows a speed up by running work in parallel, taking into account the work that can't be run concurrently, such as partitioning or integrating tasks, for example. Hence, having a six-core processor, say, doesn't necessarily mean that it will run applications six times quicker. This slide shows something of how present-day computing has moved on from the von Neumann model with a much larger use of parallelism. An internet web search, for example, could travel to any one of many huge computer centers with many processors running similar search algorithms. 
The request can be split up amongst several machines with different threads on different cores and pipelines of parallel instructions running on one core and many data items being processed at once in each instruction. And most of the processor gates in the hardware in operation at the same time. Complex systems can behave unpredictably when a component fails. The next strategy, redundancy, is an increasingly important issue at all levels of the system. For example, imperfections at the lowest wafer level could ruin a chip. If on average there are four defects per wafer of 100 chips, then the yield is still pretty good at 96%. But if there are only four very complex chips per wafer, this becomes a big issue. Redundancy and fault tolerance are key strategies then, implemented at levels from complete internet data centers to individual disk drives and memory chips. The final strategy addresses the issue of a memory latency using the principle of locality. This simply states that it's likely that any instruction or data item the processor requires to access next will be found close in memory to the previous item. Memory devices vary in speed, capacity and cost. In general, the faster ones are the more expensive and of smaller capacity. So the strategy is to load the stuff that's being processed at the time into memory locations as close as possible to the ALU processing them. The likelihood is then that most of the time the CPU can find what it needs close by in low latency storage. If, however, an item is requested that's not available, the strategy is to load its whole neighboring memory block into the local store. And only occasional high latency calls to external memory are then needed instead of them being a continuous requirement for every instruction. Well that's it for this introduction providing some background and an outline of the material to be covered in the unit on computer hardware. The course will continue to look at these issues and strategies in more detail starting with the topic of processor design.